What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Albach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. For today's episode, I had the honor of talking with internet icon Rich Kayanka, a.k.a. Lotax, and I have to be super clear about the pronunciation of his name because I messed it up in the first second of this interview, (laughs) and he's never going to let me live it down, so it is what it is, but yeah, Rich hosts a YouTube channel called Gaming Garbage, a podcast called Murder the Internet. And least importantly, he is the creator of the legendary comedy site Something Awful, which, in my opinion, may be the biggest influence on deep internet culture from the past 20 years or so. I mean, the site's got articles, forums, reviews, videos, but most importantly, it's an actual community that places value on the quality of input from its users. Um, I mean, man, so much internet altering stuff was started on something awful from the idea of photoshop battles which originated from photoshop fridays to a cultural phenomena like slender man but i think the most influential part of the site was the forums themselves uh, specifically fyad or fuck you and die <laughs> Which was an exclusive forum for flame wars where people could just go after each other for whatever. And it had like a stream of improvised jokes and content, which is where a ton of the text styles and joke formats originated that became common on places like Twitter. Uh, Rich and I got into this briefly. Uh, in fact, a lot of the FYAD users wound up migrating to Twitter early on to sort of create the amorphous blob now known as Weird Twitter, which is essentially what laid the groundwork for most of the popular content that creators all over the internet use today. Anyway, we talked about how parts of the internet from the late 90s to the mid 2000s were like a hotbed for creativity and community in ways that are way more rare now since the floodgates are opened up to literally everybody. Just how in those early days there was like a level of respect and value of originality that doesn't exist as broadly anymore with stuff like viral memes that take minimal effort to make and all these curator platforms like BuzzFeed or Fuck Jerry or whatever. Uh, We also touched on the issues with sites like Twitter, um, free speech when it comes to online platforms, and other stuff. (laughs) Rich is a hilarious guy, and he had a lot of great insights throughout this whole thing. Um, We first started interacting like over a year ago when I was on Stakem's Twitter, back before he was permabanned. And as someone who's super new to understanding just the history and absurdity of internet culture as a whole, and I always Really enjoyed interacting with him and hearing his wild perspectives. So it was cool getting to do this. And I hope you all enjoy it. Now let's get into what's really good. All right, Rich Kianka, thanks for coming on the podcast. (laughs) Kianka. You you flubbed the first line. Are you gonna hang up on me now? <laughs> no, because the the end call button is too far away, and I'm lazy. Dude, how am I supposed to know the pronunciation of your damn name? I mean, do you do interviews? I've never even heard you do an interview before. Yes, I was on the Dick Show. Uh, I was on the Riff Tracks. I was beaten up by Uva Bull. Well, I knew I that. Was... I did know that. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think they mispronounced my name when they introduced me there too. Man, you're just uh, just one of those names. I guess it's just, you're just bound for this forever. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just tell people when they don't know how to pronounce my name, I go, "Oh, it's pronounced Smith." And then they get even more confused. <laughs> Can you hear my directional? I've got my directional on. No, I can't hear anything. I think you're uh, you're good. For those listening, yeah. Rich is uh, driving in the car right now. So I'm driving to Best Buy so I can talk to Geek Squad about my Ram. <laughs> It's actually not true, but I still like talking to Geek Squad. No, they're talking about our favorite Firefly episodes. Yeah, they're good people. Wait, wait, you were on Rift Tracks? What what was that all about? Troll 2. Troll 2? Bill Dog is Goblin spelled back. What the? (laughs) Aren't you supposed to do like a minimum of research before you talk to people? (laughs) 
Not with you, man. I mean, you're like the internet's loose cannon, so I've tried to just jump into this and see what I got. Uh, apparently, I'm so loose that you, you, you don't even know a single thing. Do, do you know that I'm on the internet? Uh, you know that? No, I don't, because you were permabanned from Twitter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and Twitter defines a man. Is that it? I mean, at this point, man, in, in today's culture, like, I don't think most people don't even know something awful exists anymore, do they? I mean, like, what else is even... Wow! Like... <laughs> Good interview! <laughs> Not regretting this! <laughs> Dude. Okay, so you don't know my name, nobody knows my website, uh, <laughs> you don't know anything that I've done. You're basically just interviewing a homeless man off the street that says, uh, we'll brush teeth for cash right that, that's dude that's why i wanted to have you on because seriously like most of the people that i mean are listening to this show i mean they're youngsters they're they're people who are just on like tiktok or whatever shit so we got to educate them on some internet history and but i don't want those people <laughs> i don't want those people to know who i am i don't want to know for the people who use instagram and snapchat and vote for eggs or whatever the fuck they do on those things oh my god i want them to stay and use a bunch of stupid new slang words that I've never heard of before and will never hear of again. And just they, they can stay in their place and I can stay in my face. <laughs> That's a great example, because like even just looking at the scope of Internet culture today from what it used to be, I mean, in your prime time, like we're thinking back to early, mid 2000s, what the Internet was, that was the currency was originality and image macros and jokes, and it was a completely new landscape for people to explore creativity and all that, whereas now a lot of what it just goes viral and what's popular is other people's jokes. And, yeah, it's just like memes and, and what's uh, what's in pop culture. So, I mean, like, you've been pretty on the record with just kind of your take on internet culture as it's gone on over the years has gotten much more, like you said, regurgitated and lost a lot of originality. So, I mean, what, are you, what have been some of your service thoughts on that over the years? Well, the, the biggest problem is that they made it easier for people to get on the internet <laughs> right seriously i mean back when there was a barrier of entry and if you look all the way back to you know uh you could say bbs's or uh news groups i mean back then you know people of course were dicks to each other but they would communicate in full sentences right you know and there was some at least a hint of respect and intelligence there now it's just you know eight-year-olds have phones connected to the internet and now that there's no effort uh, that it requires to get on the internet uh it takes no effort to communicate and so that's why you've got just i mean it, it's just uh, i'm not a big fan of the internet now <laughs> I, w I wasn't back then but I'm especially not now because like back then, uh, back, back in like the early 2000s, you know, the biggest thing that you had to worry about were like backyard wrestlers and juggalos. And I, I guess you still have to worry about right. juggalos. But still, <laughs> still out there. Yeah. And of course, furries. But now furries are like the sane ones compared to people. Yeah, furries now. are mainstream. Everybody knows furries. Uh, yeah. And like uh, in the early 2000s, you know, Infowars was a running joke. Anybody who would post Infowars would get laughed off of whatever community they're at and now it's kind of like you know that's where 80 year olds get their uh gay frog news articles from <laughs> right do you I mean do you see any of it kind of coming back around because i mean obviously for someone like you and like you said in the early days the entry point was a lot higher so it was a lot of tech oriented people who understood the the landscape and were literate in what exactly they were doing online and then once smartphones and all that there's a bunch of just people who jumped on it and now we're all kind of internet babies figuring it out so i mean do you see in the next couple decades this whole thing coming around where people can get educated and literate with it or do you think it's just doomed and kind of going off a cliff no we're we're past the point of no return you think so? I mean, it, it, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, 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 like what 
What's going to happen that will suddenly make a large uh, percentage of the public intelligent? Mm. Well, what's the catalyst for that? Because right now, there's no motivation for people to, you know, not post variations of Pepe. There's not uh, there's no motivation for people to, you know, not just copy and paste and, you know, do variations of the same tired, played out shit because it's uh, and the, the, the most depressing thing is and this was I, I was kind of worried about this in the like around 2003. And so is, you know, back when people, you know, was, we, we called them image macros, like you said, and I have to give you points for saying that. <laughs> um, but people would, you know, post those stupid images and it would be a it, it, like, like instead of saying something original or intelligent, they would see that somebody else posted something funny. So if they post the same thing, then they're funny. Right. But that's then not how it works. But I well, I mean, I guess it works now because everybody does it and everybody still thinks it's funny. And they're just like, oh, yeah, this is hilarious here's that uh here's that meme of the guy holding a butterfly or here's that meme of uh the guy turning around and looking at the woman and and it just it's just like you just keep on seeing this crap over and over and maybe i'm just a crotchety old man (laughs) because i am but like it's just we don't reward creativity so much anymore as we the 4chan type shit the reddit type shit where everybody's just posting the same shit over and over because that's what we're familiar with right do you think that changed around the time of like the the entrance of the smartphone and when those companies like buzzfeed started coming out and pretty much curating all this content because i mean for most people like when i talk to friends of mine about something awful and just what the internet used to look like. I mean, for one, most people already don't even know some of the, uh, like the original memes or like image macros, like you said, that were popular on the internet in the late nineties and early two thousands. And some of the ones that they do know, they have no idea that like, that's where they came from. So, I mean, like at one... nobody knows something awful. I... <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of it. Like who the hell am I? I should just go dig my own grave and fall in. I got nothing. To... <laughs> That's exactly what it. I'm saying. I mean, like for, for companies like Buzzfeed that came around and they started to curate all of the original type of stuff that the people like you and the people like your forum users were submitting. Like, is that, around the time where this all changed because like you got like you said the currency of those forums is like if someone posts something original and then someone copies that then all of a sudden that person is just like well that's not funny anymore like that's you just copied this joke or you just copied this image whereas it's almost it completely transitioned with a lot of these curator type websites and pages where they just started to like sift through the sites like uh, something awful or uh, whatever like e-bombs world or whatever or albino black sheep or whatever they were getting the content from at the time and then all of a sudden that's being put in front of kids who aren't really literate on the internet or you know following these deeper online forums so it just becomes this big worldwide joke then at that point like is that what happened like what do you think happened in that time not necessarily because i mean you referenced e-bombs world and they were doing that to a degree back in the early 2000s taking um yeah and stamping their watermark on it and all that jazz i think it, it it goes along with the I don't want to say it's the web maturing because it's definitely not maturing. <laughs> it's just easier for people to make this garbage. You know, you got 8 million different sites where you can upload an image and then add impact font or just select uh, that animated GIF of Fry saying, take my money and right. just, just throw that everywhere. It comes down to cheap hosting and it comes down to uh, Web 9.2 or whatever the fuck we're on at this point, um, just where it lets people create content with no effort. Yeah. I mean, back in, you know, the back in my day, uh, you know, 
people that use Photoshop. And to use Photoshop, you have to have some knowledge of what you're doing. And if it looks like shit, people would say, like, that looks like shit. Get off the Internet, you know, because it, there was people cared about effort and quality and things like that. People cared about complete sentences. People cared about grammar. People cared about the difference between your and you are, you know, things like that. Yeah. And, and now it's just like you've got entire paragraphs written in emojis. And True. that's just and that's just uh, Chelsea Manning. You know, with, with everybody else, it's almost slightly worse. Yeah, but didn't, like, with some of those original forums on something awful, I mean, when, when we think, and we can get into some of this and how, like, the, the transition of a lot of the users there have then created this subculture that has transformed in whatever amorphous way into weird Twitter and to all these offshoots. What, at what point did that sort of interesting way of, like, intentionally misspelling and using weird grammar start because didn't that start with those forums where you're intentionally capitalizing letters that you shouldn't or combining words and doing all that for fun like wasn't that on something awful yeah that's all fyad yeah the weird twitter was basically founded in fyad but the creativity there started to get stifling when everybody started repeating the same catchphrases over and over and over and then they realized that with twitter it was a global platform for them to be stupid and seen <laughs> by everybody as opposed to a small pink forum right uh, and so yeah i mean there's like a lot of a lot of the users there come from fyad and things like that and the the that kind of you know the um content and grammar and capitalization, things like that, were just, you know, a parody of kind of the idiots on the Internet. And then it kind of took its own unique language. Right. So that all formed on the pink forum then? Yes. What do you think? I'm, I'll go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm not trying to sound like full of myself or anything, especially since I wasn't directly involved with that. But, yeah, there's a it, it, it's you can definitely trace it back to there. Right. Yeah. Like, what do you think made that forum so special? Um, originally, when I created it in 2000, it was a forum. It just I got tired of, you know, the main forum uh, on something awful is uh, general bullshit. And back then I got tired of people, that, you know, trying to flame each other and, you know, you're gay. No, you are the one who is gay. Uh, I disagree. The gay one here is, you You know, that kind right, of crap. Yeah, yeah. And so I just created this forum called Fuck You and Die, F-Y-A-D, and I just said, you know, like, all gross pictures and flame wars go here. And I wasn't expecting anybody to post there because it's such a stupid, stupid idea to argue on the Internet, although a lot of people disagree with me. And so, you know, people originally when uh, I'm trying to think of the like original members, guys like a devil zombie and high tower and red eye, they would go there and they would like seriously try to out flame each other, just, you know, just with the stupid effort, you know, to, trying to convince each other. Uh, hey, hey, this this is the gay guy. No, um, the gay guy, you know, is you. <laughs> and it would just go on forever. And eventually other people started coming in and making fun of how stupid, you know, the, the whole thing is. And yeah. then the people who are honestly interested in flaming each other, you know, just kind of went away. And then the culture of making fun of that started taking over. And that's kind of how that started. Right. I mean, like you say, flame wars and all that but i mean for people listening back then were people actually mad at each other or was it more just like kind of fun satirical like were no no originally they, they were mad at each other i okay. mean you can trace people getting angry you know back to the beginning of time but you know back when i, I you know i can remember people getting pissed off on dial up bbs's and then you know news groups i can remember in all rec industrial people like it's Nine Inch Nails Industrial, and then it would go on for five million pages, you know, just right. everybody arguing 
Same thing with uh, Mystery Science Theater on News Grizzly. Is Mike funnier than Joel? And then, you know, just go on and on. So, I mean, people always look for a reason to get upset on the Internet, despite the fact that nobody has ever been convinced to change their mindset or views <laughs> based off of like like nobody's ever said wow this guy this guy who's calling me a gay faggot right. uh <laughs> he's actually right about trump he's got some points you know i i i, I i've changed my mind right i mean like from then though, i mean was it was it all like so you're saying yeah there was a lot of actual animosity but I mean, when you compare the animosity of the culture from back then to now say just on a general level i mean was it was there more of like a mutual camaraderie and respect than there was now or like like how would you contrast the the sort of culture of that forum where people were flaming each other and all that to how people argue online now well not to limit it just to the forum but i mean in general what I was saying before, you know, about having the barrier of entry, people would yell at each other and call the names and stuff like that. But still, there was some sort of bond because these people had to figure out, you know, modem codes to get on right, with right. their, you know, and, and things like that. And the same thing with like uh, the forums. People would have to know, you know, the name of the forum and how to get there. And they would have to be smart enough to type in the digits of their credit card and things like that. You know, it, it, it was different just because you didn't have every single person with a pulse able to get on the Internet. So it was I want to say it's more of like an exclusive club, but it was, you know, it, it wasn't everybody and their mom. Right. On the Internet. And so there was some sort of sense of, you know, limited civility back then. But now it's just, you know, with the tools that everybody has, you know, it's easier than ever to dox people. It's easier than ever to find out all people's, you know, personal accounts because everybody uses the same name everywhere else. And so you can dig up all this information and blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, it's easier for people to be assholes now, whereas it required a little bit of effort back then. Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. So, I mean, like going back for people who, I mean, I'll give it an intro to all this to set everything up to give a little bit more context to who you are and what you do but i mean just to go back to the beginning for some people like what made you initially launch something awful back in 1998 i had a site hosted on tripod of all places and it was just a site where i would just write stuff that i thought was funny and upload it just for the sake of myself just because i liked writing and then mm, I started working at GameSpy back in like 1998, 1999 or so. And we had this, uh, we would just say things are, we were like, boy, that sure is something awful. And one day I, I just said, you know, I'm going to register that domain name. And my friend said, well, where are you going to put on it? I'm like, eh, I just want to register it. And so I did. And then I just kept, uh, you know, my my uh, personal writing on there and uh that was back when you know you could create your own website and people would uh, you know find out about it through word of mouth and i've never advertised just because i've been a big proponent of organic traffic such as uh if a if uh, somebody has a certain sense of humor more than likely their friends are going to have the same sense of humor and they're going right. to recommend it to their friends. Whereas with advertising, if you just throw shit out there, you're going to get the people who are affected by advertising. And that's not the people that I ever really wanted, even if it cost me, you know, money or whatever. I'd rather be, you know, run a site that I feel comfortable running than running a site where I'm trying to cater to these people who I have, absolutely no idea what they think is funny part of the the crazy thing about the sort of movement of something awful taking off is that it is in large part due to you at the helm of it as the kind of the crazy mastermind who's sort of steering the ship in all of this i mean do you think when you look at the other sites at the time who were trying to do similar type stuff i mean like what 
really set something awful apart from its competitors of the time? Like, was it your kind of your personality in it, or do you think that there was something about the content itself that really drew people in? Well, there there weren't any, and there still really aren't. I mean, any technically any competitors, just in the regards that it's a comedy website with a community. I mean, you go out there and you try to find another community that has been run by the same webmaster for two decades right and you won't because it makes you crazy i mean <laughs> it, 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 doing that just uh, it takes the three brain cells that you have remaining and just decimates the fuck out of them right and you know i, I stepped back like in the last decade or so because uh, you know at first it, it used to be a close community and everything like that but as you're probably aware of, people on the internet like to create drama, and that's because they usually have nothing in their lives. And so they'll make all kinds of stupid drama. And the first thing about you know creating community is you'll the, the most important thing is, and this is where Twitter royally fucked up amongst other places is that when they first created the site, they never had a comprehensive list of rules. Right, right. And, you know, it was just kind of like vague things, you know, just like, and, and, and they didn't even stick to them because, I mean, you could tell some people to kill themselves, but then you post a picture of a watermelon in your band or something like that, especially in my case. But, you know, with a, something awful, you know, I we had like four pages of rules in the Last one was just, you know, it was like, I think it's called like crazy catch all or just like, we can ban you for any reason. For anything, we can yeah. ban you. <laughs> and, and that's just because people on the Internet like to be the edge lords who are essentially they're the equivalent of kids waving their finger in front of your face and saying, I'm not touching you. Does this bug you? I'm not touching it. Right. I'm not breaking the rule. Yeah, that keyboard. kind of thing. Yeah. Because, and they want to see what they can get away with, you know, while still being in the constraints of the quote unquote rules. And, you know, between that, you know, everybody trying, not everybody, but a lot of people trying to push the envelope nonstop and just people coming up with, just just ridiculous stupid drama and you know i've had way more than my share of people who have gotten upset because i banned them for talking about nazis and unflattering things regarding minorities right and then it becomes their life crusade because i robbed them of their hard earned 10 bucks <laughs> to uh you know have this uh, it's literally a crusade against me. And, you know, there's, there's people, there's still like off sites, you know, where they're, they're still upset and they're still talking about how right, I banned them. Got banned, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's funny because these people, they're just like, Oh, well, I was ironically being uh racism and I was ironically glorifying the Nazis. Right. You can always they, fall back on that. That's the thing about making those kind of comments on the internet. It's like, Oh, that wasn't my intention. Except these uh, ironic racists and ironic Nazis inevitably turn into real racists and real Nazis, which is a weird thing when you think <laughs> about it, you know? That right. irony only works for so long, but, uh, you know. Well, you're in an interesting spot just being in the position of someone who actually has had to moderate this whole deal. I mean, looking back, we, we talked about Twitter and how you got permanent banned for that whole... Didn't you, you said uh, that you put... I got Alaska. banned 80 times. Uh, the, the, the first time was I, I said uh, Baked Alaska should, and the Prison Planet guy should be put in a room and, and uh, the room should be uh, filled full of concrete. And that was a death threat, <laughs> according to Twitter. So I got banned for that. And then I got a new account. And I said, uh, Baked Alaska and the Prison Planet guy should be put in a room and the room should be filled full of concrete. But there should be two open, unlocked doors that will allow them to exit anytime <laughs> they feel free. That was a death threat. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the other ones I got banned for. The latest ones I got banned for. 
I told uh, Nancy Pelosi to eat children. <laughs> that was hate speech against a group of people. I don't know what group of against people. Against cannibals? I guess, I guess, yeah, cannibals or children or cannibal children or Nancy Pelosi's. <laughs> She's a group the of tribe of Nancy Pelosi cannibals. Yeah, arriving the countryside, uh, roving the countryside. <laughs> Um, and then I uh, got banned for saying, for, for some reason, I was just on this Nancy Pelosi kick. And I said, dear Nancy Pelosi, if you break into my house and go into my basement, I will throw a chessboard at your head. I will not miss. I guarantee <laughs> this. That was a death threat. And then so like at that point, I'm just like, you know what? Somebody working at Twitter was got banned by me. On my forums, like, you know, a decade and a half ago. Right. It is not, it, it's not worth it just because Twitter, you know, you, you can post jokes and, and, and then stuff like that. Well, I can't. But, uh, you know, in theory, you can post jokes and shit posts and things like that. And a lot of people on there are funny. And I do miss my contacts. But it's so negative. Yeah. You know, everybody, it, 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 we're, we're in a culture of outrage where to show people that we're intelligent and emotional, we get mad at everything. And that goes for both sides. Yeah. You know, it, it's just like, you know, both the, the the right and the left. I mean, but on Twitter, everybody is so outraged. Yeah, at it's, always, it's always feeding oh, into man. itself. It's like it's so and it happens literally every week. I mean, I just remember. Last week, I don't know if you saw that whole thing with uh, that. Dumb... Haven't read it since I was banned. Good. So like, there was that dumbass uh, YouTuber Logan Paul. You know that guy who's everybody hates him because he did the uh, the suicide forest thing or whatever. And everybody he... hates him because he's unlikable and terrible. Yeah, literally everything he does is terrible. <laughs> but he yeah. he posted some comments last week about how him and his buddies were gonna do, do, try to go gay for a month. For like gay oh, yeah, pride or something yeah. like that, but it's like yeah. something like that happens. Whereas like we've seen Logan Paul use outrage and use these outrageous comments so many times at this point to get attention, but still everyone is clicking it. Everyone's commentating on it. Every because you know that if you don't commentate on it for clicks, someone else is going to commentate on it for clicks, and it's just the cycle where you got these provocateurs like Milo Yiannopoulos or. Gavin McGinnis or whoever it might, or Baked Alaska, who they know that they're gonna if they say something outrageous and push the boundaries on it, that it's gonna infuriate so many people to respond, and it just keeps feeding the cycle and it just keeps going. Forever. Well, at least the racists are somewhat getting run off. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean that's a good thing about it, but it's just. Yeah. Not only do people get outraged about everything, but they have to one up each other and say, like, you know, I'm going to get more outraged than this previous guy, because that shows that I'm more caring and I'm more understanding. And then you've got these people standing up for minority groups who last time I checked, they can stand up for themselves. But you've got uh, these people sticking up, uh, not even sticking up, but just saying, oh, well, this could be offensive to this group because blah, blah, blah. It's just like, okay, if it's offensive to that group, you know, they can come out and say right. that it's offensive. You don't need to make it your personal crusade to be offended by everything all the time to show, you know, what a deep and caring and intelligent individual you are. Right. Especially because, I mean, if you're not, if you're an activist or a journalist or maybe someone who's a little closer to the issues, at least it makes some sense. But for most people, yeah. it's just moral posturing. You, you and I have both seen people who have made, I mean, specifically on Twitter since the 2016 election, there's been, I have no idea how many people that have made entire careers off of literally commentating on outrage on Twitter who get these massive yeah. followings from literally, it's like they're sitting at their computers waiting for Trump to tweet something or waiting, you know, for whoever to tweet something and they just jump on it right away with the most virtuous sounding thing and that's their entire brand at that point. Yeah, and the, and the problem is, is that it actually goes against their cause because people just become... You know, they're so used to people saying X is the worst thing ever 
that it no longer, you know, they, they see another article and they're just like, okay, well, it's more, more hyperbole. Right, right. You know, it, it doesn't like Bush is Hitler. Bush is Hitler. And then it's just like now people are saying Trump is Hitler. You're like, well, what about the previous Hitler? Right. He was Hitler too. You know, how many Hitlers are there? Godwin's okay. law. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and so, like, it's just the worst, in my opinion, are male feminists because they just annoy the shit out of you. Because last time I checked, there, there, there's at least two women on the Internet. <laughs> and um, if they're offended by something or if they have opinions on something, you know, I'm sure they they will share their opinion. I mean, my wife does. She tells me things. I listen to her. Right. She's a feminist. But but the male feminists, uh, you know, especially the ones who turn out to be extra rapey, exactly. you know, to yeah. try to cover up stuff. It's just like, I, I understand, you know, uh, having a moral compass and things like that. But when you make it your crusade, yeah. you know, to be sticking up for these groups that you're not a part of, you know, it, it just becomes extremely annoying. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm a right wing. Well, no, no, no. But it feels creepy over time, like you said, because it's, it's different, I think, between if there's a situation where something happens in the news or whatever, or maybe someone close to a person and you want to express solidarity of some type in, in a specific incident. But for the people you're talking about, it's people who make this like their daily brand it's like every time something happens they have to put out their post you know it's a constant stream of trying to you know look like they're all on the side of like there was this whole article it was hilarious because it was taking all these tweets from these young dudes who i guess are part of like bare minimum twitter at this point and it's guys who will tweet stuff that <laughs> is literally it's saying nothing but they'll get tens of thousands of retweets and likes for this stuff well they'll be like dudes we need to be better for girls just like that and then that gets like 10,000 retweets and it's just so weird and gross and it's not really saying anything I mean you look at these guys you're like are you actually do you actually care about these issues because it doesn't seem like you do like you barely put the bare minimum effort into whatever this thought process was and it just came out and now you're getting praised for really saying nothing at all well, yeah, and I actually have a problem with that because I don't want to get better for women. You know, I, that's like effort. You know, I, I just kind of want to either <laughs> stay myself or, you know, degrade to a certain point. Just keep where degrading. I'm <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, I'm 42. I'm tired of trying to get better. I'm just going to accept myself for the sloth-like failure I am and, and just be like, eh, that's the way it is. So I, I'm not interested in getting better for women yeah. but i'm okay I, I, i'm okay to women i i only hit my wife during sex and um after there you go so, <laughs> shame yeah. free yeah exactly in 93 but yeah it's and and the, the side effect of like all this you know the like you said uh the the low effort or whatever you called it uh twitter is that People think that, you know, it, it, it gives this artificial sense of community and, you know, people start believing, believing that they're the shit, you know, because they're like, right. yeah, I got um X hundred thousand Twitter followers. And you're like, you know, you think you step back and you think about it. And it's like the same thing as like an Xbox gamer score. <laughs> like, OK, if a hundred thousand, like, OK, what does that mean? Right. How does that right. benefit? You. You're, you're you're making money for a company uh, by posting free content. Are these people actually your friends? It means nothing. Yes. But we Fake live in internet this, points. Yeah, we we live in this weird kind of pseudo reality where people on Facebook, people on Twitter, think that you know these uh, a non these little avatars and names are actually their friends, but they're, they're, they're not. They're, they're just, for all intents and purposes, they're just data right. floating around. 
Yeah, I think about that in terms of how much you take what people say on the internet with a grain of salt. Because, I mean, for someone like you, when I look at your persona and your character and who you are, it's like, okay, Rich has created something and he's led something. He's participated in the actual original content creation of stuff that means something on the internet. So someone like your opinion or your take on whatever actually has some intrinsic value to it. I mean, whether people like it or not, people can get mad at that or they can enjoy it, whatever. Whereas there are certain people on the internet, like you said, because they've kind of created this persona for them, it is like a brand. Like it's a personal brand persona where they feel they have importance. Like they feel like they've done something to earn them clout. So then they, they have like this heightened sense of their opinions and who they are. But then if you, in your case, like where you got permabanned from Twitter, for a lot of these people, if they got permabanned, then there goes their entire identity and who they are. Because when you strip it away, there's really nothing there in most cases. I mean, obviously, some people can have lives outside of their online life and all that's great, and I, <laughs> I uh, commend that. But there's definitely certain people who make their online life everything, and they act in accordance to that without really doing anything. Like, you know, I get certain messages from people criticizing me over whatever, whether it's something with Stakem or something in my personal life. And a lot of times, like, if it's someone who's following me and wants to give me some good constructive criticism or has, like, a debate about, you know, how I went about something, that's interesting to me. If you want to have a good conversation, like, I'm, I'm open to being criticized, I'm open to whatever I might have done wrong, but... There's all these people who have just this heightened sense of importance where they can just say, you know, you're wrong, you're an idiot, this is stupid, and in their minds, it's something that's, it's coming from this place of importance. That's it's self-entitlement, you know, yeah. everybody yeah. on the internet is self-entitled to have their opinion and to shout it and to uh, tell people as much as possible. Right. And the, the, I mean, the, the thing that's helped me survive is that I don't have a character because <laughs> no, I, I seriously don't. I mean, I just say like what's honest to me and I've always tried to run my site and the community, how I feel is right. And how as a member thinking as a member of the community, how I would like to be treated, you know, that that's always, and of course that's, hasn't financially benefited me, but at least, you know, there's only, there's only one person, you know, that you can really please. And that's, that's yourself. And that's only by being true to yourself. Mm. You know, you, you can try to fake a character. You can try to be somebody that you think other people will like when, but when it comes down to it, you have no idea what other people are going to like, and you're not going to be happy with yourself for putting on, you know, this act. And so like, you know, when people say, Hey, uh, the low tax, you're, you're dumb as hell. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, okay. You know, when cool. uh, people say like, Hey, uh, your opinions are really stupid. I'm like, uh huh, they are. But you know what? I, I, I just don't, if they're not members of my family and like you said, somebody offering constructive criticism, I don't give a fuck. Life's too short. Yeah, I totally agree, man. I mean, you're in an interesting position of having to moderate people, and you've been doing this for over two decades now. So, like, when you look at something that we were talking about, the sort of the ambiguous Twitter rules and how you, know, you can get banned for saying something that's clearly satirical, whereas something else that's an overt threat might get overlooked. And it's like when you're in the middle of all this as a moderator and as a member, what's your position on the whole free speech wars at this point? Not not like the culture war perspective necessarily, but kind of on the internet level where you have people on sites like Something Awful or even 4chan or Reddit where they've been users for a long time and in their minds what gives them livelihood and excitement about the platform is that they can say whatever they want without consequences and then like as time goes on uh, like you've been alluding to like obviously there's some stuff that you can't allow being said there's certain content and material that you need to step in in certain cases has your thought 
thought process changed on sort of your your principles on free speech on your platform, particularly in, in general? Or like, where do you stand on that whole debate at large? We've never allowed free speech. And that's just because when you allow pure, unfiltered free speech, you learn how stupid a lot of people are. Right. And, you know, that's like, you know, we've never allowed Nazis. We've never allowed uh, bigots or people who, you know, hate homosexuals or, you know, things like that. We've always leaned a lot towards the left and we put it in the rules and people are aware of that. That's that's the big thing. And so, you know, being lumped in with 4chan and Reddit, first of all, I have to say, fuck you. But (laughs) second of all, you know, they they, you know, 4chan. Obviously, they embrace the, uh, I don't want to say free speech, because I think if, you know, people who were left-leaning went there, they'd get run out. Right. Because, you know, they're not saying that uh, black people are genetically inferior to uh, rocks. But, you know, and then with uh, Reddit, uh, I I still haven't been to Reddit, actually. Really? (laughs) But I I know it's, well, I have no reason to. Right. I, I, I Stick to like four sites on the internet, and that's about it. Just trust every time I venture outside of them, I get upset at how terrible everything is. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's there should be no uh, pretense of free speech on the internet. A, because you know, you can get sued for people, you know, expressing their quote unquote free speech Mm -hmm. and B because it doesn't ever help a community. No one. I mean, look at Gab. I mean, Gab is like the bastion of free speech and they're getting booted from server to server because no one wants to deal with, you know, their uh, pro Hitler crap all the time. Yeah, exactly. And it just keeps making its way down the line. I mean, you're going to eventually you're going to get booted from every server and then you're not going to have a place to host a website anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's circling the, the toilet like almost, you know, it, it, like deplatforming Alex Jones, deplatforming. Back in the day, you know, everybody would say just don't feed the trolls. But now, I mean, that was back when people were intelligent enough to not feed the trolls. Now everybody falls for the trolls. Everybody right. falls for they the stupid. Gained the system, yeah. Well, they haven't gained the system. They've just taken advantage. They've taken advantage of the fact that the general public it isn't um, really up there on the. Uh, again, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sound like. Um, I'm not trying to talk down uh, to the general public, but the general public is terrible. <laughs> if you've ever worked retail, you know, if you've ever Any worked service a job, yeah. Server, yeah, if you've ever have to de- deal with the general public, you know that they are terrible. Yeah. And uh, the uh, free speech people, which in this day and age, free speech just is a synonym for stupid speech. They're able to take advantage of that just because everybody will fall for it. And a lot of people actually do believe that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like even like a site uh, like 4chan, just, I remember it was a few years ago. I forget what the exact incident it was, but they ended up in the news on CNN for something. And, you know, that that anytime does it happen with Reddit too? like anytime these bigger these kind of deep Internet sites end up on the news, it's like, OK, all the eyes are on it now. And I remember the CEO or the whatever, the, the founder, Chris Poole from 4chan, he like came out and made some statements that were basically saying like, yeah, we're not we're not for this. We don't want to allow for this kind of speech on the site. And then since then, oh, oh. a lot of the users are like, screw him, man. And like that's. <laughs> So it's it's funny how like you can't win because like, as as a moderator or as someone who wants the site to flourish and to emit good communities and get rid of bad people and all that you can't you can't have it both ways no matter what because there's always going to be that subsect of people like you said who just want to keep pushing it and as long as they're there I mean it's just going to lead to not just bad publicity but just bad communities like you said with um with alex jones it's like the past several years something happened where 
Alex Jones found his way into the mainstream and was actually being taken seriously, whereas in decades past, it was all just a joke and sort of fringe and funny. Like, we all like to make our Alex Jones impressions and jokes, but at some point it started getting taken seriously because of the platform that he had. And it's like, what is the solution to that other than deplatforming at some level? And, like, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it is a weird time to be in with that i mean with you you're kind of you're on a little bit more of an intimate level than a site like youtube or twitter where these are like massive tech corporations and like them controlling people's data i understand like that aspect of it is really freaky to content creators and users because at any given point they can turn on whoever they really feel like it just like with you where you got banned for pretty much a total subjective reason that really shouldn't have gotten you banned in the first place. So that aspect of it is freaky, but from like an absolutist standpoint, I mean, you're right. Like it doesn't really make sense to have that attitude like, oh, free speech, anything goes no matter what, because that doesn't make for the best communities or the best content in general. Well, no, and even not online, there there isn't pure free speech right and the, and the rise of alex jones has you know it, it pretty much coincided with the rise of smartphones and everybody's on the internet and again you know going back to the fact that a large uh percentage of these people are technically illiterate um and if you're technically illiterate you're more than likely illiterate on many different levels and, you know, back, you know, back in the day w- when there was actually a uh, entrance barrier to getting on the Internet, you had, you know, again, more tech savvy people, more you had more people who actually, um, you know, the, they would invest time and, uh, you know, research on like, you know, how to get on the Internet and jazz like that. And now it's just, you know, pretty much anywhere you go, you've got Internet access. So it's pretty much a direct correlation between the amount of people getting on the Internet and, you know, the rise of these idiots. And so these uh, social media sites have, you know, they they can't just say, hey, uh, just ignore these people. Right. Because people are people will keep falling for that and they won't listen. And, you know, they'll, a lot of people believe that crazy ass shit that these people are saying. And so by, you know, deplatforming them, that's pretty much the only option they have. And then you also have to look at it from the point of view as, as a community, are you really losing something by, you know, hopefully you can not only get rid of Alex Jones, but you can alienate all his followers into leaving as well. Yeah. And that's what we tried to head off early on by having these rules saying, you know, you, you, we're going to ban you for saying the Holocaust didn't happen or uh, the uh, water is making frogs gay or, you know, <laughs> whatever. It, because these are the type of the, the people who believe that kind of stuff are not the people who build a strong community. Yeah. And it's not the community that at least I want to be a part of and. I've always tried to, you know, stay kind of true to myself and have rules that would be, you know, would result in community that I would be proud of and not say like, oh, yeah, well, we banned Moot. And then he went on to create 4chan because I didn't want any of his creepy ass anime underage girl. Oh, no, but she's actually she looks like she's nine. But she's a four million year old witch trapped in the body of a nine year old. I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to have arguments about how old a girl is in anime because I, first of all, I don't want to look at it, and second of all, anybody arguing on behalf of questionable child porn in anime is somebody that I don't want on the site. So it's like buy moot, and then so he created his own god awful abomination to a degree i mean that 
type of deplatforming, t- despite what people think about it in the sort of free speech warrior spheres, I mean, it actually does work in a lot of cases. When you look at someone like Milo Yiannopoulos, no one's heard anything about that guy since he got booted from Twitter, and I don't know where else he got booted from, but his pretty much his entire Everybody. brand. Yeah, I mean, like, once he came out with those statements that went viral and everything, I mean, he lost everything. When you're in that position as a tech company, and you you have this huge, huge platform, and you have your users and your community, and you see a person like that who's dangerous, or they're really they're presenting ideas or rhetoric that is hateful, or whatever that might be, I mean, like, you don't really have that many choices at that point. I mean, it does, I am under the impression, again, kind of separate in the something awfuls or the reddits of the world from like the, the Facebooks and the, the Twitters, which are multi-billion dollar tech companies, because ultimately they, they have to be nationalized or something has to happen where there's more rules in place. Because with cases like yours on Twitter, I mean, yours is not a unique story in the sense that I can't even tell how many people at this point have been banned for just saying innocuous or satirical jokes, and it's all just so subjective. And it seems like in the how many years, it's been like a decade since Twitter's been around, nothing has gotten better. Like, the infrastructure hasn't changed, there hasn't been any clear set of rules, and, like, that is something that Something Awful did from the beginning, which has kind of, I guess, maintained your integrity of what you want, where you're very clear about the set of rules that people coming on the site have to abide by, which I think... You said it perfectly. I mean, ultimately, there is no free, there's no absolute free speech in any of these cases. So, I mean, you have to kind of draw a line somewhere. Well, yeah, but I think that nationalizing it is not necessarily the answer because um, I don't want to, you know, sound crazy here, but it's not like the government can do anything well. Right. Uh, especially run tech companies. I mean, uh, Jesus, can you imagine? Donald Trump running Twitter? No, I can't. It's just, but don't you think, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert in this field at all. You're just my thoughts because I agree that government running it would be a disaster. I mean, also at the same point where a lot of these companies are right now, I mean, they're obviously incapable of making clear cut decisions. Like, do you see an alternative solution to any of this or is it all just going off a cliff? Well, they can make clear-cut decisions. I mean, some of them are debatable, and it's like, you know, in my case, which I would also like to point out that I was perma-banned before Alex Jones. Thank you very much. Yep, the original. They, they, they found me more of a threat than Alex Jones, and so which I, I thought was, yeah. And I was banned eight times, too, before Alex Jones was banned once. But there's like, you know, they can run it however they want i mean it's like uh, you know the eighth the time i was banned i was just like you know i wasn't mad i was just like okay it's the way it is it's their company that's what they want to do if that's how they want to run it that's how they want to run it i'm not gonna there's no crocodile tears coming from me because i i can't shit post on twitter and make jokes that turn out to be death threats against uh, nancy pelosi and or children <laughs> Um, you know, it's like no skin off my back. I don't, I don't give a shit. And as far as I know, nobody really relies on Twitter for income. And if they do, they're insane. So it's not like nobody's entitled to have an account on Twitter. It's not like, um, electricity. It's not like water, you know, it's a private service where they can make their own rules, no matter how stupid and um, unevenly enforced they are. And so whatever, let them do their thing. If they keep on fucking up, then, I mean, they're, they're too entrenched to have another service come in and take over. You know, you, you, you can see it in the news articles where instead of actually reporting news, they just say, oh, social media is up in arms about this. And then it's just copy and pasting from Twitter. Yeah, exactly. It's just a bunch of people's tweets. And I, I hate those articles. It's just like, <laughs> it's like eight people. And yeah. they're, they're, they're trying to say like, everybody's up in arms over this uh, new epic fail in media. And then it's just like eight people. And one of them's like Goku 420 Big Daddy. And right. it's just like, 
<laughs> Lol, this dumb. Yeah. Hey, whatever. Bunch of Twitter eggs. Yeah, I mean, you come from a, from a unique position, though, because, I mean, you kind of have that mindset of live by the sword, die by the sword. Like, if you're if you're dishing out the moderation, like, you know that you have to be able to take it. And you, as someone with a site, like, you can have the perspective to say, like, obviously this is my site or this is Twitter's site. They can do what they want with it. But I do think, uh, on, like, a broader spectrum, there are actually a lot of people who, at this point in time, oddly enough, do rely on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and these platforms as a means to make their money. So it is, like, a really bizarre time to how do you make money on twitter uh like a lot of people i mean from twitter directly people will set up paypal accounts or whatever like a uh i forget the app you can just link to it so people just ask for money in some ways i mean indirectly they use it as like a conduit to whatever their brand might be you know that's that's more what i mean like i don't mean in most cases people aren't making money directly from the site but they'll use it as like their primary platform then to push people into other websites or wherever they're actually doing for a job so it is kind of strange in that way because you know they have created this global economy where especially like youtube and facebook more i think more so than twitter but twitter included in that where if you do get banned for something completely subjective that is highly problematic at this point for better or worse so i don't know like i i have have pretty mixed feelings on all of it again just because there are these massive tech companies and it sucks knowing that they can just make subjective decisions based off arbitrary rules at any time they want but at the same time like yeah i don't know if if it's not if nationalizing it isn't the solution i don't really don't know how you could ever fix it at this point because the rules haven't been in place for so long clearly so, like, how do you just now jump in and start drawing lines in the sand? I don't know. Well, it can probably be fixed by them having a page that pretty much lists the rules. I mean, as far as I know, they, they still don't really have a comprehensive page that lists everything. And then having at least some sort of arbitration system. I don't know if they have that now. Yeah. But, you know, back when they banned me uh several thousand times you know there there would be no nobody to contact or to say like um i'm joking here um because they, they didn't care yeah and it's, and it's, and it's still it, like that like i just i just yeah, read just the other day an article uh ashley feinberg did an interview with um jack from twitter and pretty much directly in the article i mean he's responding to a a question regarding customer service harassment all these complaints people might have and jack has still no solution except the report button it's like the report button literally does nothing like most of its run most of the 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 reports that are filed are just run through algorithms anyway it's like there's no actual people working in the customer service department that you could ever get a hold of it's ridiculous except in my case where they clearly had somebody hands-on monitoring because i don't think any algorithm would pick up nancy eat the children (laughs) and and say like you know what that is discriminatory hate speech against a particular group of pelosi's or children or whatever yeah that's that's true Uh, (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it plus my uh my report button mysteriously disappears when i'm banned so really? I, I can't even, yeah i don't know where it goes wow. I don't know. if you had to guess looking at the the amount of people who work at twitter and facebook and google or any of these companies like how many people do you think work for them at this point where back in the day they would have been users of the forums for something awful like do you think it's a good chunk of those people that fell into those tech companies? Oh, yeah. I can remember back in 2003 or so, if you did a search on Google for something awful, our website would come up on page 14. And so I wrote an article about it and saying, like, if you search for www.somethingawful.com on Google, it comes up on page 14. That's insane. And... And it turns out that one of the furries that I banned 
was in charge of uh, some something with the, the algorithm or something like that. And mysteriously, everything went back and, you know, it became the first search result after I wrote the article about that. And the person, as far as I know, was either fired or moved to a different place. But, yeah, I mean, in, in these, you know, back in 2003, there was more latitude to get away with that kind of thing. But as you can see, there, there still is, they still can, you know, interfere with stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it, for the first seven times I was banned, I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I don't want to sound self-important enough to think that this is a conspiracy or some targeted thing against me because I hate it, you know, when the when, when people like Alex Jones, oh, they're war and conservatives, blah, blah, right. blah, they're right. targeting me. You know, I, I don't want to sound self-important enough to believe that. But then it kind of got to the point where I'm just like, okay, there's definitely something going on here. And I just I, I didn't even try to fight it i was just like it is the way it is so goodbye twitter you kind of hinted to this before where at some point in like the i forget when the date was in like the mid 2000s when you kind of stepped away from um uh, moderating and all that because you were getting all like these death threats and everything like did it was a lot of that due to you moderating at that point or was it just kind of the way that the site was headed and you were just caught in the middle of all of it um i i just got tired of the drama you know i had kids and everything and the people that i would ban you know it, it's it, ten dollars doesn't really seem like a um huge life changing thing to normal people but to the abnormal people you know that back then they weren't uh, accepted or part of any community, then they found something awful. And then they're just like, Oh, wow. There's all these people here who I consider my friends and, you know, I can post stuff. And then, you know, they felt like they were a close member of the community because it was really close knit back then. And so by getting, by getting kicked out, it's this grievous offense to them. Because, you know, I'm taking away their virtual family, which is pretty much, I'm assuming, all they had because, you know, most people don't get all emotional and dramatic over Internet stuff like that. If they get banned, they just kind of like, oh, oh, well, right you know, on to the next community. We'll do. Yeah. But, you know, I had it. But the, the people would get so upset with me. You know, I had people calling my well it's just person but i'm calling my the kids school and saying i was molesting my kid and other fun things Jesus. like that you know i, I had weave dox me um oh uh, yeah just, just like stuff like that and i'm just like you know i'm just kind of kind of step back and let the mods do their stuff just because it's not fun for me so much anymore and people treat me very strangely you've got either people that are trying to suck up or either people who are trying to uh uh, tell the principal of my kid's school that i fucked them uh so it's just like you know neither extreme is particularly enjoyable to me do you Um, imagine but like stuff is calmed down and it, it just you get to a point where you, you try to if it affects my real life and if it affects my attitude in a negative way, then I try to avoid it because, again, life is short and I don't want to spend emotional energy on Internet drama when I could be spending my energy you know with my kids or family or uh what's that what's it called when you marry a woman oh your wife you know my wife (laughs) super yeah the real important stuff (laughs) yeah like how like how much do your kids actually know about what you do i mean like are they extremely online as well or do they they know everything so they do they they actually give a shit or they kind of just like not invested are they doing their own thing or they oh no we've done like um when they were doing riff tracks live you know i had my daughter two of her and back when our animator wasn't insane diaper fur pedophile furry 
um, person <laughs> who um, wore a yarn wig. Um, b- back when he was slightly uh, more normal, you know, we had some animated shorts that showed in 700 movie theaters for the Rift Tracks Live of um, Plan 9. And, uh, you know, they, they I'm completely open with them regarding pretty much everything, you know, because I, I was telling my 13-year-old, uh, I'm like, do you ever get bullied at school for, you know, stuff that I've written? And she's like, no. I'm like, wow, they really, they're crappy bullies. <laughs> you know, because I, 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 I've, I've written so many things that people could make fun of her and embarrass her for. But they, they haven't even done, like, just the basic late work on that. It just makes me upset. But You're it, most you know, offended I, by it. You're like, come on. Yeah. I mean, like, like step up your game. You know, I thought you were supposed to, bullies these days were supposed to be, you know, all tech savvy and stuff like that. I mean, just do a search for, you know, her dad's name. You'll find me, you know, the, talking about shooting cum into robots' eyes or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but, but, like, I, I, I believe parenting wise to with the exception of sexual stuff to expose and talk to my children about you know as many real things in life as possible i don't think there's there's obviously nothing to be gained talking to them about sexual stuff but you know you know my uh 13 year old she plays overwatch you know so i she's known for a long time the quality of the people on the internet yeah, and yeah. how to deal with them Next to her uh, computer uh, monitor, she's got a little piece of paper where she marks down every time she gets somebody to rage quit because, you know, (laughs) people will hear her, you know, on on, uh, voice com and they'll know that, you know, she's obviously a teenage girl and then they'll, you know, do the, the, uh, the, the responsible things like, you know, calling her a dumb cunt and a bitch. And, you know, I I told her how to respond to that, and that's not to get upset, but to make them angry because it's the easiest thing to do. So what she does is, like, if they start doing that, she's like, who's talking? And then, uh, you know, she'll just, like, start (laughs) off with that, and she's like, is this Angry Birds? Are we playing Angry Birds? And she'll be like, where's the guns? (laughs) Where are the guns? You know, just say things like that, and they'll be like, you're a stupid bitch, and then, and then she'll say, like, Daddy, is that you? Oh, my you know, God. It, it just, just, like, completely, you know, it, it, if you pretend like you don't understand that you're getting trolled, that makes them the most upset just because they have no, there, there's no way for them to, you know, up the game. There's no way exactly. for them to say anything. And then they'll be like, you're stupid. And they're like, who? You know, it's just like, you're stupid. Yeah. Who's talking? You know, and and just like that. So it's like, you know, you teach your children that people on the Internet are shit and how to deal with them instead of trying to make them avoid everything. You know, because that's not going to work. Exactly. Like, they're going to figure it out eventually. But that's such a great way of teaching your kids. I mean, it's like you're handing them the keys to the Internet. That should be taught in schools. Why is that not taught in schools? I, 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 uh, my, my wife just called, so I didn't hear anything you said for the last two hours. <laughs> I'm assuming you said, why don't they teach that in schools? It, it's just for the same reason that parents raise their kids kids saying oh don't watch this don't watch horror movies or don't uh you know don't go here or talk to this person or listen you know which never works (laughs) well exactly because they want to do even more you know it's about uh the the fact that you you can't raise children in a culture of fear because it doesn't work anymore and you you can't isolate kids from the real world anymore especially now that the fake world is so intrusive in their lives right the internet i i believe in treating my kids like uh quasi adults you know like like within parameters but still you know if they're not prepared for the real world and then you send them out to it you can't shelter your kids you can't make them afraid of the world. You can't try to cover their eyes 
you, the best that you can do is giving is give them coping tools, is to give them mechanisms to deal with things and to teach them how to react because these things are going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. And the last thing that you want is your kid entering the world and then not knowing how to deal with just, you know, common, basic, idiotic things. Right. Which are just everywhere online. I mean, it's gotta be super interesting for them growing up you know, with you as their dad, because I mean, I personally, I mean, I view whatever you want to call it, I guess your role in internet culture as like, you kind of set the table in the past two decades for some of the best, I mean, and some of the worst of what we see on the internet today. So, I mean, like regarding like how they see you or how you see yourself, I mean, like how do you describe your role at this point of the development of internet culture? I'm uh, just a guy. <laughs> You're not just a guy. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's how I see myself. I mean, it's just like I, I, I've just done what I thought was either entertaining or right. And I've just tried to be true to myself and shit has happened. I've been blessed with a really good community and I give them a lot more credit than myself and just stuff has happened. I mean, uh, I don't, uh, I really don't place myself on self-important or anything like that because I don't know what I'm doing. I've never known what I'm doing. I just kind of do it. But isn't, so. isn't it kind of crazy for you at this point? I mean, looking back on everything and seeing a, not just, like I said, not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff and just every part of it from the past two decades, how it's so much of the most defining internet culture really stemmed from something awful. I mean, even as I, was, I had uh, this girl, Michaela, Oakland on the show for this last episode, and she's a really popular Twitter comedian, joke writer type. She's really young, and she was saying in uh, in the interview how you know when she first got onto Twitter, you know, so much of what got her into the joke writing was the weird Twitter style accounts, and how like that was the sort of original um, formatting which inspired a lot. Of the what I guess what are kind of the new guard, if you want to call it that, of creators. She never heard of something awful. I forget if I asked her. She may have heard of it. I forget, but she's young. I mean, she was only twenty-two, and it's the queer kind of got into it a little bit. And it's just crazy how for someone like her and people younger than her that are coming up on these sites, it's like a trickle down. Like they're getting influenced and inspired by the popular creators of whatever that generation is whereas so much of that if not all of it stemmed from something awful it's like isn't that kind of crazy to you no i mean <laughs> like i said it, it was it, it's mostly you know thanks to the users there right. not anything i did specifically and you know it's not like i'm getting royalties for the concept of jokes right you know it, it's just like you know, whatever, I'm a washed up relic of the past whose most notable accomplishment was getting beaten up by an angry German movie director. <laughs> oh, man. Is that, that's, not, that's not what most people know you as. There's no way. Some people know me as the guy who, who is addicted to Ambien and box wine, too. All, all good things. I mean, like, how, how is something awful doing these days? I mean, you have, pretty, you have a closer role again, don't you, in moderating? Not really. No, I, I I mostly make fun of people on Facebook. No. <laughs> so you move from just Twitter because, to Facebook. Yeah, just because it's it's the kind of shit that I post on Facebook isn't. Uh, I, I would like people to post with effort on something awful, and so the stuff that I post is not effort. Mm. It's me just making fun of people or saying I'm going to come in a robot's eyes right. again. <laughs> Right. Um, I don't even know where I got that from. I just made that up. That can be but the title yeah, of it, your book. It, yes, the book <laughs> had uh, coming in a robot eyes. Also, mango scene. It's perfect. Um, but yeah, it, it's just you know, I, I uh, we're still serving up like fourteen terabytes of data a month. That's insane. I mean, do you see? Are you, are you planning to keep it going into the next few years, or do you have anything else on the horizon? You're trying to bring in, like, what's your role in it at this point? Uh, cash and paychecks. Yeah. 
No, I, 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 I want to um, get as much money by doing the least amount of work possible. <laughs> but the way that I look at it is I put in my time. I, I went through the tough periods of time uh, where I was spent, you know, I had a full time job and I was spending my paycheck to pay for bandwidth. And, you know, I had the everybody harassing me and going through all that jazz. And so I'm just like, yeah, I did my time. I can uh, if I had laurels, I'd be resting on them. But I, I just have a bed. So I rest on that and watch Lifetime Network movies. Oh, Lifetime. That's your thing now. That's cool. Yeah. No, they're great. It's like uh, uh, you, you get to see like uh, Deceived at 17, 16 fooled at 16 my uh evil stepdad there are other great stuff i love <laughs> lifetime network movies from the 90s all the classics yeah i mean like so with that i mean do you have i, I know you got your podcast uh, murder of the internet going on and I, I don't even we haven't done that forever i know you stopped doing it a few months ago didn't you yeah so like what's, because... what's going on like you got current projects or like what are you doing right now doing some riff tracks writing stuff but Jonathan and uh, our schedules just didn't really work out, you know, because he does the his radio show weekdays from 6 to uh, 10. And then on the weekends, his time was limited. And plus, nobody listened to it. That was a big factor. Well, you, you're promoting it through, I mean, like, what channels are you using? Because you got your YouTube show, I know. You do the gaming commentary and all that. And then obviously, if something off. Awful- garbage. Yeah, gaming garbage. So, I mean, do you have a channel on Facebook that you're helping to promote this stuff? Or do you have any other platforms that you're promoting your projects? No, I don't. I just kind of do them because I, I, and I do them very infrequently because I only do them uh, to entertain myself yeah. and to beg for money. <laughs> but mostly to entertain myself because I'm, I'm not going to do something if my heart's not in it because people can always tell. Right. Um, I'm, and I'm definitely not going to be one of those stupid uh, YouTubers who fake all that shit just to get views. Like in and, the show, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of act like myself, so that's all I can do. I've been the Best Buy parking lot for two hours, and I need to go in and get <laughs> the camera. All right, man, let's get out of here. I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed speaking to you. On uh, you're you're the Ruben report, right? Oh my God, man! Shut the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the 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 worst, best thing you could have uh, possibly said. I mean, I've spent so much time railing on that guy on the show. <laughs> Literal goals, though. I mean, that's that is goals. Totally. I wanna I wanna eventually cash out big and start shilling for uh right-wing corporations and get some of that coke money that's the goal ultimately speaking of this is kind of a funny story i'd like to end on uh there's a handyman working on our house because uh, uh my daughter's toilet upstairs flooded and then all the gross ass toilet water started dripping down from the ceiling in the kitchen uh. And so he had to tear that down or he cut, you know, into it. And um, he was uh, looking at my um, setup downstairs because he used to run a podcast on eBay or about eBay. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was about. And he asked me what mine was. And I was like, oh, it's uh, called Murder the Internet. And he's like, oh, I'm going to check it out. And then so I got, you know, like a few weeks later, he came back. He's like, yeah, it's really funny. Um but yeah, I ran out of episodes to listen to, but I found a new podcast. And I'm like, what's that? And he goes, it's Ben Shapiro. Oh. <laughs> the logical and, next and, step, dude. It's the logical next step. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> bye. And I closed the door. <laughs> oh, that's perfect, man. At least it wasn't a, uh, does Baked Alaska have a podcast? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't. Know what he has anymore? I don't think he has anything he has anymore. <laughs> yeah, he might have a tractor. Some John Deere stuff. That's it's always nah. important when you've been banned from the internet. All right, man. Well, I appreciate all the time while you've been sitting in your car. 
and uh, well, well, we'll all miss you on Twitter. I mean, this is it's been a rough uh, culture without your your bombastic commentary on there. So. Yeah, the bombastic commentary. Have everybody uh, bite for me and, and say free low tax and start that campaign. I there do once in a while hashtag that, and I always get some some people, some goons or some like random users who are like they find the hashtag and they're like, yeah, yeah. And so there's it's maybe there's. It's serious. I haven't been unbanned though. I know it is absurd. And I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, I wish there was like a direct path somehow. I mean. I don't know. Maybe we can figure something out. But all right, man. I will talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one, Sargon. <laughs> See you, Ruben. <laughs>